I'm excited to introduce our next speaker. He's the president of Fuller Seminary, and he's going to talk to us about transformational leadership. Mark Laberton, would you come on up and share with us? Well, it's a great gift to be able to be part of this gathering, and uh, it was yesterday as well down in San Diego. This is a, an amazing ministry, Barnabas Group, as you know, and it's one that I think touches on lots of nerves, partly because I think we have a deep longing that our faith will actually matter in the world, and surely the enterprise of a, of a gathering like this is meant to help achieve exactly that. So thank you for your attention to that, and as, at Fuller Seminary, we're seeking to form leaders for global kingdom vocations. We'll talk a little bit about that later, but the whole sense is, how do you prepare leaders? I want to suggest that one of the things we hold in common as different as our ministries may be, as different as our, sometimes our own even theological backgrounds may be, we have a deep sense that all of us are called in one way or another, whether in ministries or in workplace settings, to be able to be leaders that are going to stand up and live and speak and act in a way that's going to make a difference for the gospel. And the reality of that challenge of leadership, I think, has been uh, never more imperative and urgent than it really is right now. If you were to look at the whole landscape of the world, surely one of the things that we would say is that Almost every nation, every context, every institution is in a season of reevaluating itself and trying to understand what its own leadership vocation really is. And in every setting, there are all kinds of personal, institutional, political, social, and economic reasons for, for why it is that leadership is both difficult and compellingly needed. So I want us to think about what it means to be leaders and what it means specifically to be transformational leaders. The first thing I think we need to ask ourselves is simply, do we know where we actually are? Do we know where we live? Now, of course, on one level, we obviously have some sense that we know where we live geographically. We have an address. We have a place that we spend most of our time. But on a deeper level, do we know where we live? Do we really understand the moment that we're in? I want to suggest that, uh, that in the Old Testament, there are two great paradigms. The first paradigm is the paradigm of the Exodus. In that paradigm, it's clear that it, Israel lived in Egypt, and the goal was to get out of Egypt to another place that God had promised, the promised land itself. And this movement from bondage to freedom is really the heart of the whole Exodus paradigm. It defines Israel's life. It's when Israel's identity as a nation is established. It's when the law is given. It's when the revelation of God's name is given. And it's when God gives a transformational leadership call to Moses. This was nothing Moses was looking for, as you'll remember. He felt incompetent for it. He felt inadequate for it. It felt as though this was really God doing a Dave Gibbons on him, uh, calling him to an unexpected life uh, and an unexpected moment, an unexpected interruption that God was saying, I just want you to show up confident in my voice and confident that I will provide uh, the capacity for you to be able to lead. That period in Israel's life continues, of course, and Jesus continues, in a way, the Exodus call. The Exodus call is a call from death to new life. It's an amazing call. It permeates our understanding of what we're meant to be as Christian people. But what's interesting is that our nation was really established, for many people at least, it was established out of an Exodus kind of process. People coming from some place to this place. Some got to New Jersey and thought maybe this is the promised land, and others thought, well, I hope not. And they kept kind of moving westward, each declaring, you know, for some it was Milwaukee, and for some it was North Dakota, and for others it was San Diego, and Orange County, and the glories of Southern California. So there's this amazing sense that that process goes on. And as it gets overlaid with a kind of secularizing process, then actually what was originally a spiritual vision, which was in many ways the heart of, of a lot of people who immigrated to the United States, then there was just simply the secular vision, the economic promise, the opportunity for a certain kind of social opportunism that came about as a result of that transition. And then we baptized, really, much more of a secular vision in the name of Jesus. So I still want largely a secular vision. I just hope that Jesus will give it to me. And the church often lives, I would suggest, in that kind of zone. Jesus is the giver of my promised land destiny. He's the, he exists to be the means by which I will get the things I want. Now, I wish it was less the case that that really describes broad swaths of the church, but I, I think in fairness, after 30 years as a pastor and as a Christian for most of my adult life, it's been really clear to me that a lot of that convergence occurs, and it, it's really no longer in any case where we live. 
we don't really live in that promised land. That was the promised land that created, in many ways, Christendom, Christendom in North America. Christendom where there were institutions and structures and patterns that created all kinds of support structures around churches. It was what gave birth to what we sometimes call American civil religion. It's what gave birth to a kind of Americanization of American culture that is interwoven with a Christianization. But the two are kind of interestingly intertwined and not necessarily clear in their own biblical or theological affirmations. And often, I think, are much more about our sociology than actually about what we believe about the character of the kingdom itself. So that combination is a very complicated combination. And I would suggest that that paradigm has really spent itself, culturally speaking. God is ultimately going to bring us to the promised land. But I think the paradigm that is the second major paradigm of the Old Testament actually has more compelling and urgent relevance, which is the paradigm of exile. Israel was sent into exile because, not because there was a marauder, in, this, in that case, Nebuchadnezzar and, and the forces of his own military. No, Israel was sent into, into exile because of a form of God's spiritual discipline. God had said to Israel over and over and over again, I want you to be my distinctive, peculiar people. I want you to follow me. I want you to look like me. I want you to do the things that, that matter to me. I want you to show up in ways that are going to demonstrate my justice and mercy and goodness to a culture and world that looks peculiar because your life is meant to be a mirror of my own character. That's what the whole prophetic literature is about. And ultimately, Israel is disciplined by God, sent into exile, stripped of the temple, the sacrificial system, the freedom of the land, in which they believed that God had set up a theocracy for their own rule. And in that context, now suddenly, Israel is stripped of all of those signs, and now having to ask, so who do we follow? Who are we going to be? How are we going to live? What does leadership in this context actually mean? I want to suggest that we are really now a church in exile. That it would be a great gift, a great help, a clarifying help as an American church especially, if we could understand that the world around us has abandoned Christendom and the church is now not in any way lost in hope, but it is perhaps disoriented in its structure. So a great deal of the American church, it seems to me, is caught up with nostalgia, with an attempt to try to recover a period before exile. Meanwhile, exile is all around the church, and yet we need to often go much farther than we have in understanding the significance of what it means to live as strangers in a strange land, not finding institutional patterns of social life and economics and security in certain forms that are traditional. And instead, we now have to live in a much edgier culture. Now, it's worth just saying that most of the church in the world actually lives clearly in exile. It would never even occur to them that they think they live in the promised land. They totally get that the edginess of their faith puts them at odds with their circumstances and calls them to live a distinctive way of life. But often in North America, I think we're slow in acknowledging that the terms have changed and the ministry to which we've been called is really a ministry of a church in exile. That is not a hopeless picture, far from it. It is, however, a peculiar picture. It's not what the church has expected. So we go back to the Old Testament, I think, and we find there and in the New Testament all sorts of images that help us understand about what it means to live as faithful exiles. Let me suggest that one place that has been very, very meaningful to me has been the book of Daniel, a book written about faithful exilic life. It's a book that I want to deliver this morning, not from the dangers of the, of the fire or the lion's den, but the dangers of the felt board. What I mean by this is that often I think the book of Daniel has been imprisoned in Sunday school curriculum as kind of a two-dimensional figure that you put on a felt board. It's what children talk about and do little plays and musicals about. But in actual fact, I want to suggest that what I see in the, in the book of Daniel is a tremendous encouragement to call all of us in our respective roles of leadership to think about what it means to be transformational leaders in a season and context of exile. The book of Daniel begins with an introduction that you know is a sort of a quick map of the fact that Nebuchadnezzar and his forces of Babylon had overtaken uh, Israel and in the context of that had taken out from Israel what any good plunderer does, not only anything that they can profit from, but in particular certain key leaders, here described in chapter one as the best and the brightest. 
And those people are then going to be assimilated to Egyptian culture, to Babylonian culture. They're given the best food, the best education, opportunities for restarting their lives, et cetera, et cetera. And in that kind of context in Babylon, they are given the chance to be fully assimilated with the theory being that if you could assimilate the best leaders, they will go out to help the whole population assimilate. What happens in chapter one is quite remarkable in that regard. You might even think that for those that got taken into Nebuchadnezzar's house, they had won. The danger was not enslaving to them. It was opportunistic. But Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, decide that they're going to live in a very distinctive way. They know that they live in Nebuchadnezzar's house, but they're going to remember every time they eat that they belong to Yahweh. What I think chapter one is about is that faithful transformational leadership in exile means remembering our identity. This is the first thing that's at stake. The first thing that's at stake in exile is that we get disoriented. Even significant long trips that any of us may have taken causes us to lose reference points. All those things that are the signs of who we are, who our people are, what we're about, what, we ma what matters to us, all of that begins to be uneasy and unsettled when in fact we go into a new context. Well, exile is a new context. And every day our culture sends us thousands of messages of who we are. This is how I want you to think. This is what I think you desire. This is what I believe you believe. This is how I think you should act. These are the things that should matter to you. Endless messages. And in the sea of that bombarding, exilic messaging comes the question, but who are we? Who are we as the people of God? Do we really understand and practice our identity? In this particular case in chapter one, it came down to a very practical matter of observing the dietary law. They decided that every time they ate, they were going to sit in Nebuchadnezzar's house under his nose and eat in a way that honored and remembered Yahweh was the one who gave them their identity. They belonged to Yahweh, though they lived in Nebuchadnezzar's house. So the question is, how do we practice our identity? What are the actual practices? Not just the theological affirmations that we might make, but how do we practice that we are genuine followers of Jesus. The book that we gave you this morning that I wrote entitled Called is a book which really is saying in the first act, the most important call is the call to be a follower of Jesus, which it turns out is not a set of convictions. It's actually a way of living in the world, a risk-taking way of demonstrating that we are actually following someone, actually doing something in the world. Are we actually living in that way. Clearly, Barnabas exists in order to try to stimulate exactly that. So it's that theme, but what does it really mean for you to remember your identity daily? Chapter two is a very different chapter. Here, suddenly, after all of the quick sketch of Nebuchadnezzar's power in chapter one, chapter two, you encounter Nebuchadnezzar as the person who is terrified. Terrified, the text says, of a nightmare for which he has no explanation. It's a, it's a nightmare of an extraordinary kind that threatens his very being. Here's the person that's seen as the most powerful person in the world who's now trembling. And he wants real spiritual insight. He goes to his usual soothsayers and projectors of fortune and says, now we're going to set a new test. This time, because I want a real spiritual word, the way it's going to work is this. You need to tell me the dream, and then you need to tell me the interpretation. And if you can't do both things, it won't be a real authentic word. So I need both pieces. They say, no, 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 see Nebuchadnezzar, the way that it works is that first you tell us the dream, and then we give you the, the interpretation. He goes, I know you're just trying to buy time, and this is not the usual song and dance, not this time. I want to have a real, authentic word. So I need to get something that is greater than you yourself are able to demonstrate. I want you to tell me the dream as well as the interpretation. Now what's fascinating about this is that Daniel hears word of this. He threatens the lives of those who are being asked to give this information. If they can't deliver it, it will be off with their heads. And instead, Daniel steps toward this great, urgent, passionate, fearful need. I love that. Do we have the instincts to step toward need? If we're going to be courageous, transformative leaders, you don't see a crisis and then run the other way. You don't first ask, how do I make myself safe? You first ask, how it is that God might want to use you in that risk-taking, dangerous setting. Daniel steps toward it. Nebuchadnezzar is asking for an outlandish thing. No one knows how to 
and knows what the dream could possibly be. Daniel rushes back to his friends and says, look, guys, this time we really have to pray. Not just a little prayer meeting, but like we have to beg for mercy that the God of heaven will actually demonstrate and clarify for us what the dream was and what it means. Fascinatingly, the dream is actually about the destruction of Nebuchadnezzar's empire. No wonder he's terrified. They, God does reveal it. Before they go back and tell Nebuchadnezzar the dream, Daniel and his friends pr pray and they acknowledge to God that God alone is the raiser up and lowerer of kings and, and queens, the one who makes kings and kingdoms and destroys them. It's this God who's going to do this work. They go back, they tell Nebuchadnezzar, well, this is really a terrifying dream and it's understandable that it would be terrifying for you. But here is the actual truth. It is about your kingdom at the top and stubble at the bottom, which is going to mean ultimately the destruction of your power. Now that is a risky thing to say to the most powerful person in the world. And yet, out of faithfulness and courage and transformational leadership, dependence on a God who's given them this gift, Nebuchadnezzar not only hears what they've said, but receives it and thanks them for it. Right? This, is, this is like an anxious diagnosis that you fear is going to be bad news, but at least when you get the bad news, you know what reality is. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to know what is reality. So much false leadership goes on because people are unwilling to tell the courageous truth. That's not what happens in chapter two. So in chapter one, they remember and practice their identity so that when the crisis arises, they can actually step toward the danger. And then in chapter three, something even more interesting occurs. Here, Nebuchadnezzar actually ironically builds the nightmare of chapter two. He creates this idol and then asks everyone around him to bow down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Listen to just a little bit of the language of this section. Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue whose height was 60 cubits and whose width was six cubits, and he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar sent for the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and the, all the officials of the provinces to assemble and come to, to the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces assembled for the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they were there, standing before the statue of Nebuchadnezzar that he had set up, and the herald proclaimed aloud, Now, you are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble, you are to fall down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall be immediately thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, as soon as the, all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Accordingly, there were certain Jews, the people who had saved the necks of those who are now about to rat them out in this part of chapter three, who don't bow down and worship the golden statue. They repeat all of this to Nebuchadnezzar. They said, O King Nebuchadnezzar, live forever. You, O King, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble shall fall down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. But there are some who hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire mu musical ensemble who do not fall down and worship the golden statue. Nebuchadnezzar, in characteristically furious rage, then goes to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, demands who are they that they think they could actually escape this. And so he says, so I say to you now, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble, you shall bow down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And who is the God that will deliver you from my hands? Extraordinary kind of arrogance. Now the great high point will come in just a moment. It's not the fire and the deliverance from the fire. It's that these leaders live unhooked lives. This is the critical thing. See, the whole pattern is idolatry always works best when it's caught up in a mesmerizing rhythm. A mesmerizing rhythm that might literally be musical, but it may also be cultural. It might be social, it might be economic. This is the way it works, we say. I got that cue, 
I just fell in line. I did the thing that everyone expected to do. Everyone else was bowing down and worshiping the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Who am I? Who are we that we should not simply bow down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up? The mesmerizing rhythms that we are caught in are the patterns of what it means to live as exiles. But the question is, what do we do about the mesmerizing rhythms? There's endless mesmerizing rhythms that control your life and mine every day economically, politically, socially, visually. We are cued in countless ways to just fall in line with the mesmerizing rhythms. If we didn't do that to some degree, we would have nothing but social chaos. So fair enough, mesmerizing rhythms aren't inherently evil, but in this case, it was the ability to be able to distinguish the greater danger from the lesser danger. And the greater danger, it turned out, was not the fire. It was actually the idolatry. What captures the American church, I fear, is that we are really actually an idolatrous church. We confess Jesus Christ as Lord, but in the face of dangers and in the pressures of mesmerizing rhythms, we want it all. And then we bow down to any and other things than simply God and God alone. Transformational leadership in this moment will be transformational leadership that has the capacity to remember who we are, chapter one, to actually practice living beyond our own capacities and competence, chapter two, and being able in chapter three to remember that in fact we need to practice the capacity to live unhooked lives, distinguishing the greater from the lesser danger. And so they say the most remarkable thing in all of chapter three, they say, oh Nebuchadnezzar, you silly little man. You may be a rageaholic and the most powerful person in the world, and you may be about to throw us into a fire seven times hotter than any fire has ever even imagined being before, and we are just not going to bow down and worship the golden statue that you've set up because we are free. God may deliver us. God may not deliver us. It's not a, 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 as though we're going to work something out with God as though he's the deal maker. No, we just realize that the greater danger is the idolatry, and we're free to let the rest of it fall where it will. Friends, we need to be transformational leaders like this. I want to be competent, chapter two. I, I want to rely on my abilities. But God is calling me and calling the church beyond our abilities to those places of transformation where we actually live in places of risk, uncertainty, lack of competence. It's not because competence doesn't matter. It's because it cannot hold the final word. What the world needs is not more human competence, though, frankly, that would help us a lot. What the world actually needs is something that only God can actually provide, a capacity to do what only God can do. And the most peculiar thing that we're called to do is bear witness in life and action to that reality. This is what we're called to. Faithful, exilic life is remembering our identity. Who are we? It's not just a mental confession. It's a practice. Secondly, it does mean taking risks beyond our competency. Where are we prepared to live toward danger and uncertainty and lack of competence? And then where are we willing to actually live listening carefully to the mesmerizing rhythms that may capture us or the people around us and to be able to live unhooked lives in the middle of that that help lead other people to live unhooked lives as well? Fuller Seminary in this moment is reinventing itself in every possible dimension. And our call is to really raise up and form leaders for a global mission, which involves work locally, in churches, in nonprofits, and in vocational enterprises across the whole array of culture and society. Half of our students go into Christian vocations and half of our students don't. They come specifically wanting more biblical and theological training. And what we are called to do, I think, is to help form a generation of leaders for a church in exile. That is an entirely different enterprise than the traditional vision of how seminaries have been defined and formed. But this moment is not a moment like every other moment. And in this moment, that is our vocation. If you look on page 37, you'll find uh, various ways in which you could be invited to be partners in this. What I've tried to sketch this morning in this book from Daniel is a sense of what the great call, I think, of this moment is, a call that's amplified and expressed in wonderful ways in the New Testament as well. And to remember that that linkage between that kind of vision and Fuller Seminary is really at the heart of what I think we're trying to do at Fuller, and what I think many of us are trying to do in our own respective ministries. This is a kind of shark tank, a Christian shark tank gathering, an opportunity to be able to hear from different ministries, to consider their claims, to think about ways that we could be involved. 
We all have to make leadership decisions in those characteristics and, and contexts. But in these deeper ways, are we people who will remember our identity? Will we take a risk beyond our competence? And are we prepared to live unhooked lives? You and I are meant to be transformational leaders who do that kind of work. And if we do that kind of work, then in fact the creation of what God is wanting to do in this season to show a faithful people in an exilic context, it will bring God great praise and glory, and it will allow the church to thrive as I think we're really meant to do. Amen. People often worry about online education because it isn't incarnational. Didn't Jesus come and spend time face to face with his disciples? Isn't that required for real learning, for real transformation? But in theological education, I often refer to scripture itself. Paul wrote one of his most weighty letters to Christians living in a city he'd never visited, people most of whom he'd never even met. What about Peter and James? They wrote to whole regions of the Roman Empire. Does that make the letter to the Romans or 1 Peter or James somehow less legitimate, less formative? Don't we continue to read these letters today? Though distant in time and space, aren't we being transformed by them? That's the kind of education and formation that online education invites.